more to do on the revelation and uh, more things to talk about that are there that are useful. I hope that you'll find that they are useful. And uh, we're talking about the bride, the wife of the lamb, which is the city of God, which is Jerusalem, which is the church that belongs to Christ. And we're interpreting these things that are said in the Revelation by using its interpretive key, which is the rest of the Bible. <laughs> and sometimes the Revelation itself, you know. Um, but it's the rest of the Bible. That's where it came from. These are known things. Yes, they're symbolic, but they're symbols that come from a catalog that you have in your hand. It's They come from the rest of this book, so you got to look for them. And he said at Revelation 21, 9, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. So that's the thing that we're looking at right now. And I'll remind you that Ephesians 5 makes very clear, though the mystery be profound, it is, in fact, the case that the marriage relationship refers to Christ and the church. So it is the church that uh, we are talking about. And though these... Uh, symbols in Revelation 21 and 22 chiefly come from Ezekiel, Isaiah, and Zechariah. We are looking this time at the things the holy city is made out of, the materials that are used in its construction, and these things are not, by and large, coming from those prophets. These are coming from kind of all over the place, and uh, so we'll look at that together, and I hope that that will be also an encouraging thing as we pull together more and more uh, books and more and more symbols that cross uh, time and uh, ages, uh, you know, nations. You come to see uh, what was noted earlier today in our class that Man did not do this. Man could not do this. <laughs> this is the plan of God, and it has been the plan of God. You can see that he is working in this. Man didn't make this up. He couldn't have. He could not have possibly have known what was coming and what would happen. So that's one of the great things, I think, about the Revelation, is it pulls together lots of different passages from people who did not know each other, did not live even in the same era, maybe even in the same nation. Which is the way that the truth is. <clears throat> the New Testament, if you will, is that summation of everything that came before our lives as Christians, is that summation of all that was written in the Old and the New. So we're looking now at what the holy city in the Revelation is made out of, what that thing that is revealed there, the wife, the bride of the Lamb, is the, the, uh, the great high mountain, the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. And you find in the 21st verse of Revelation at verse 8, or I'm sorry, chapter, 21st chapter of Revelation at the 18th verse, that wall that was described earlier, we now find, is built of jasper. Uh, what is jasper? Well, it's a transliteration from Greek. And what does that mean? Well, it's not important. The point is that the name of this thing is a precious stone. That's the point. It's a precious stone. Um, yeah, what does it mean? Well, it means something like shiny, glassy, you know, um, but it's a word, it, you know, basically is a proper name that they used for a specific precious stone, a jasper. Um, but the wall is made out of jasper, which is telling you something that came up a little bit earlier in the Revelation in chapter four, the first kind of, I guess the first foray into the symbolism, straight symbolism after addressing the churches directly is chapter 4, in which you have a scene of the throne room of God, which also is borrowing heavily from Ezekiel and Daniel. But um, in that scene in Revelation 4, verse 3, the one who sat on the throne had the appearance of Jasper. So 
this is telling me something fairly specific, I think. In your Revelation 21, 18, if the wall is made out of jasper, and jasper is the appearance or the radiance of the one who sits on the throne, Revelation 4, 3, that's telling you something. God is our protection. As in the exodus of the children of Israel from Egypt, when they crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, it said in Exodus 14 at verse 22, the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. And you may recall too that God separated the Egyptians from them in the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. He went before them to guide them through the wilderness. He stayed behind them as their rear guard when they needed protection. This is telling us that God is its protection. God is its wall. The radiance of his glory is what keeps it safe. The city has, in addition to walls, um, the, the buildings of the city itself and a street. There is only one street. <laughs> Actually, it's more like our term plaza. This is a, not just a street like a lane or an avenue, but um, what we would probably call a plaza or, um, or a mall or something like this, where you have a wide open area um, that a street, you know, is adjoined to or is, is going through. Um, you still see these, in, especially in, in Europe. Um, but the idea is that there's just one of them. Anyway, it has composition. Both the city itself and the street that is in the city are made out of the same thing, which is pure gold, like glass. Um, as for the... the uh, the street, I would comment in Acts 24, uh, something that needs to be said about that. When Paul was being examined by uh, Rome, he clarified something saying, according to the way, which they call a sect, those who are accusing me call a sect, I do worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets. The way is what the book of Acts says, or it's the term that the book of Acts uses to refer to the church. Um, if you look through the book of Acts, it calls this the way. We're on the way. Um, and what is the way? Well, the way is the street or the road. The seed that falls by the wayside is, is, you know, literally would be the seed that falls on the shoulder. It's the side of the road where, you know, as you know, there is some dirt, sometimes little bits of weed and grass grow there, but not a really, it's a pretty inhospitable environment. That's why that seed that falls by the wayside uh, rarely takes root. It's picked up by the birds, right? That's the side of the road, the shoulder. The, the way that is God's way, the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, 6, is the church. This is the street that we are on. We're on the road that leads to heaven. Um, maybe you would associate it with the road of uh, Psalm 1. But um, that's the way that it's described here by Paul and in other places in the book of the Acts. I didn't want to go through the whole lesson of showing what the way is, but this is a pretty good uh, summation here. And I like Acts 24, 14, because Paul is saying, I do worship God according to the way, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets, which is exactly what we are doing when we look at the Revelation and we see where it came from, and it came from Exodus and Isaiah and Ezekiel and Zechariah and a lot of other places. 
We also worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets. And this also is in accord with the way, the church that belongs to Christ. That's what we're doing. So the street or the way um, in the book of the of the Acts is the church, the street of that city. Well, that, that's the centerpiece. That's what this is. I would note as well that the gold there, it says pure gold, which is a, one way of saying it, but it's it really is purified gold. It's purified gold in the same way that 1 Peter 1, 7 talks about our faith being tested for genuineness, which is another way of talking about purity. Our faith is more precious than gold that perishes, though tested by fire. It's true that uh, the carrots in gold are... Um, are not the orange things that give it its gold color. No, the carrot is <laughs> how much of this volume is actually gold versus some other thing. And it comes down to how long has it been fired? You know, as much heat or as much fire, as much time as, or the more heat, fire, time is exposed to, the higher the carrots. The less of other material is in that, is in that gold because it's driven out by fire. And of course, you know, the higher the carrots, the more expensive the gold. Even though at some point a jeweler will tell you, and I'm the son of a jeweler, um, it's impractical. <laughs> if you're buying a ring that you intend to wear the rest of your life, go with 10 carrots. Because otherwise it will be gone <laughs> before you retire. <laughs> Um, but the precious, uh, you know, the, the price of the gold does not exceed the, the price of the faith. Our faith is more precious. But you see that comparison being drawn, and it's not the only place. There are actually several places where we talk about this, and James talks about counted all joy. Um, and places in the Old Testament that speak about testing gold, purifying gold driving out the dross from silver, things of this nature, and comparing that to the people making it through trials and through tests, which is true. That's what's happening for us. That's purified gold. The city, that is the structures within it, and the street, the plaza in the city, are made of this purified gold. <clears throat> Jesus said in the Beatitudes, Matthew 5 and verse 8, just by itself, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Those who have purified themselves are the ones who will see God. This also is something that the Revelation talks about in the city of God, that they see God. They see his face. And he is there. So blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. Jesus himself set it forth in that beatitude to say, well, there is a purification process and we need it. And having completed that, as Peter said, there's a preciousness to it, or the Lord says, blessed are they. They have a reason to be happy because they will see God's face. Uh, over in, in Hebrews uh, 10, <clears throat> I liked this illustration as well because it talks about a purification that is necessary on more than one level, different things that all of them draw upon the idea of purification. Here we are. I would go in Hebrews 10 back to verse 19. Brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, 
And let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who is promised is faithful. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and to good works. So you can see that we're drawing near to God with a true heart, where Jesus had said uh, back there in Matthew, blessed are those who are purified in heart. They'll see God. Here he said, we draw near with that true heart. We have a full assurance of faith, which reminds us of where of First John, where he said, if our hearts do not condemn, condemn us, then we have confidence to approach him. Um, our hearts are sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, which also refers to 1 Peter 3, speaking of the appeal of a good of a conscience, a good conscience towards God in baptism, in water, for forgiveness of sins, which is not the removal of filth from the flesh. The clarification there of 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21 is what's being uh, brought forth here in Hebrews 10, 22. Hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, bodies washed with pure water. These are all purification processes. We come to God with a true heart. You can only come to him when you're willing to be honest with yourself and with others. Um, and you only his when you obey him in baptism, putting to death the old person and resur being resurrected a new person. That's where the heart is sprinkled clean from the evil conscience. And it's also a mechanism in which the bodies are washed with pure water. Not that the water is the power or that the water is holy in some way. It's just saying there's a specific reason why you're doing this. There's not power in the water, as Peter said. It's not the removal of filth from the flesh. It's the conscience. But this also is purification. And Jesus inaugurated this way into the holiest of holies that we are traveling on. As we mentioned at 1 Peter, we go back to chapter 1 of 1 Peter, not the third chapter this time. Ah. And there's a call. He says, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, as Hebrews said, Love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. Right? All flesh is like grass, all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower fails. The word of the Lord remains forever. This word is the good news that was preached to you. So we have purified our souls by obedience to the truth, and this leads to the sincere brotherly love, which James also said in chapter 2, famously, and Hebrews told us, let us consider one another, just how to stir one another up in love and good works. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. That purified heart calls for an earnest love, and the church should be characterized by love. I'm not ashamed of talking about love or think that that makes you soft somehow. Uh, it's true. This is very much a biblical idea and a biblical concept. I understand that it gets uh, oversold, uh, overgeneralized, used maybe too often and unspecifically. Um, but the truth is that it is important for us to walk in sincere brotherly love, that we ought to be concerned for our brothers and sisters in the Lord and what's happening to the members of the church and how we can help. But that's part of the purification. To leave the world is to leave, you know, hating one another and being hated, to leave the, the envy, the enmity, the strife of the world and walk in this sincere brotherly love towards one another. Going back to the Revelation, um, again, in the 19th verse is another reference to this purified, or I'm sorry, the 19th chapter, is another reference to the purified gold or the gold that has been tested by fire. You see an interpretive key there if it wasn't already clear from all the other places. But you see in Revelation 19, they are singing in heaven. And it says in the seventh verse, the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. 
it was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Fine linen, bright and pure is purified linen, like what we would probably term bleach. <laughs> it has been purified. Who did this? The bride. The marriage of the Lamb has come. The bride has made herself ready. It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. What is that fine linen? It's the righteous deeds of the saints. Is that consistent with what Jesus said? Yes, it is. Is it consistent with what Peter said? Yes, it is. Is it consistent with what Paul said in the letter to the Hebrews? Yes, it is. Entirely consistent across the board is this idea that we are tested and that the test produces patience, but the test produces value. Our faith is valuable both to us and to God but it's demonstrated through works, the righteous deeds of the saints. <clears throat> All right, so we go back to the plan of the city, or I'm sorry, the uh, composition of the city, the materials that it's made out of in Revelation 21, and we have the 19th and the 20th verses telling us about the foundations. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth or hyacinth, the twelfth amethyst. So there are Twelve foundations we read earlier, which are the twelve apostles. But we read in Revelation 21, 19, that they're adorned with every kind of jewel. And I think every kind of jewel is the point. It's every precious stone, things that are precious, things that are valuable, are what the foundation is made out of. Now, if you think about the foundation of the building where you live, it's probably concrete <laughs> and rebar, if you're lucky. Um this foundation is adorned with jewels, jasper, sapphire, agate, emerald. You know, the precise identity of these uh, precious stones is not really important. That's not the point. As if you're trying to figure out who is the first apostle or which apostle is represented by the carnelian, which people have done, I promise you. That's not the point. <laughs> <clears throat> the point is that the foundation is made out of jewels. Ours tend to be made out of concrete or dirt. But this one's made out of jewels. What does it mean? Well, it means more than one thing. And um, I would turn, this one's maybe a little bit harder, and I hope that you'll follow with me, but I'm sure that this is right. Because it's kind of the only other couple of places where you're going to find a list of layers of things that are a list of layers of jewels. Exodus 28 is the place where the Lord instructs Moses how to make the breast piece of judgment. <clears throat> And in Exodus 28, it begins at verse 17 and continues down through the 20th verse. But I'm going to go a little bit further back than that. 15 is where you could start. You shall make a breast piece of judgment and skilled work. Style of the ephod is the style you'll make this out of. Gold, blue, purple, scarlet yarn, fine twined linen. But the 16th verse said, it shall be squared. That's interesting. <laughs> the span is its length. The span is its breadth. Hmm. In the 17th verse, you shall set in it four rows of stones, a row of sardius, topaz, and carbuncle as the first row, second row, emerald, sapphire, and diamond. Third row, 
jacinth or hyacinth, agate, uh, agate, amethyst, the fourth row, a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper. These are to be set in gold filigree. There will be 12 stones with their names according to the names of the sons of Israel. They'll be like signets, each engraved with its name for the 12 tribes. That's interesting. What are they going to do with this thing? Well, if you look further down uh, in Exodus 28, um, you can see the 29th verse. So Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel on the breastpiece of judgment on his heart when he goes into the holy place to bring them to regular remembrance before the Lord. That's interesting. These stones are almost the same stones that you read in the Revelation. And you know, like I said, the naming of jewels is cultural phenomenon. The the Sometimes people take this word that's a common word that means something like shiny or red or whatever, liquid, um, and turn that into the name of a gem. And maybe they imported it from another language, so it really has this obscure name. Um, so I don't need them to match one for one. It's fairly clear that we have here another configuration of 12 stones, another configuration that corresponds to the tribes which correspond to the apostles, a another place where God said this is square and it is worn on the heart and it comes before the Lord for remembrance continually. That's the foundation of our city, don't you see? That's what the church is built on. He said that it's like a signet, remember, to identify them. They're precious stones. But what we're finding um, in connection with this, or I guess in conjunction with this, if you turn with me, it's Ezekiel 28. What Ezekiel 28 brings to this discussion is, is just this. Ezekiel 28 is not related to Israel. So it has nothing to do with the temple, the tabernacle, Moses, the breastplate, of, breastplate uh, piece of judgment, the holy city of God, the foundation. It has nothing to do with any of that. What it's useful for is that it brings up the exact configuration of Exodus 28. Sardius, topaz, carbuncle, emerald, sapphire, diamond, jacinth, agate, amethyst, beryl, onyx, jasper. That exact configuration appears in Ezekiel 28. Every precious stone was your covering, sardius, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, carbuncle. The, the exact same list. But it didn't have anything to do with Israel. What it, what's happening in Ezekiel 28 is verses 12, um, or, well, yeah, verses 12 through 15 there. But what's happening is, this configuration of stones is intended to represent something. It represents perfection. It represents beauty. It represents divine establishment that God made this, that God ordered this, that it's God's design. That's what it's saying. And you can see this in Ezekiel 28, where he says, Son of man, Raise a lamentation over the king of Tyre, Ezekiel 28, 12, and say to him, thus says the Lord God, you were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. Sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, emerald, and carbuncle, 
and crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. It's almost a direct quote from Exodus. You were an anointed guardian cherub. Oh, yes, on the day you were created, they were prepared. You were an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. In the midst of the stones of fire you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found within you. And here begins the lamentation of Tyre. But it started out saying, you were in Eden. Adam and Eve got kicked out and they were prevented from getting to the tree of life by the guardian uh, cherub, but you were the guardian cherub. Every precious stone was your covering. And these are they. What's it saying? It's saying that was perfection. That was beauty. That was what God established. As he said in, uh, in uh, Ezekiel 28, at verse 14, I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. He established it. He made it. That's what this foundation signifies. When he tells us the foundations are adorned with every kind of jewel, and he gives this list, and it's 12 of them. It's referring back to this figure of the breast piece of judgment and that configuration, though the breast piece of judgment is not given particularly more meaning than the fact that Aaron carries it for square on his heart before the Lord for remembrance of the people, which is pretty fantastic. But when it's revisited by Ezekiel years later in connection with Tyre, Completely Gentile uh, nation on the coast had nothing to do with Israel, Exodus, Moses, the temple, the prophets, nothing. He refers to that as the signet of perfection, the beauty and, and loveliness of the creation in the garden. So what's he saying in the Revelation? Well, The foundations are adorned with this. The way that God founded the church is in perfection. Could it be that like Tyre, the church has corrupted its way? Well, in instances, that can be true. But we also have today the day of salvation to make correction for these things. And I do think about what he said. We lament Tyre because it used to be the signet of perfection. It used to be full of wisdom. It used to be perfect in beauty. Innocent and pure from the day you were created until sin was found in you. There came a time when it became proud and when it began to take pride in its possessions and its trade and, and became one of the detractors of the people of God and one of the enemies of Israel. And it was cast down by God who had put raised it up in the first place. He has a way of doing those things in the affairs of men. But that's telling us to Maybe things have gone off the rails, you know, in a local church. Maybe it's not what it should be. Maybe it has been characterized by, ah, one says one thing, one says another, and nobody knew why they were here. That's the worst assembly in the world there in Acts 17, or uh, Acts 19. If you didn't know, that was an assembly, a church, if you will. The church is the assembly when they were brought together into the square, when there was that riot over Diana of the Ephesians and they, they dismissed the assembly, that's, that's the same word for church, you know. It was the worst assembly in the world because some shouted one thing and some shouted another and nobody knew why they were there. And you say, does that describe the church? Sometimes. 
Sometimes it does, which is bad because the assembly is designed or is uh, defined by the reason for which it assembled. Why did it come together? Which is another way of saying what the holy city is made out of. Tyre had a lamentation because it used to be wisdom. It used to be perfection. It used to be beauty. God had established it, but it left. So what is the holy city made out of? Well, it's made out of the most precious things that there are. The glory of God is its wall <laughs> to protect it on all sides. <clears throat> right? Its construction materials for the, the road and the, and the buildings within it is the righteous deeds of the saints, the purified gold of a faith that is tested for genuineness. And that is action. That's deeds. Not just faith, but uh, faith working together with works for justification, James 2. Oh, yes, Abraham was a friend of God, if you will, but not until he offered Isaac. Oh, he believed God when God said, you'll have offspring, numerous as the stars. He believed him and God considered him to be righteous. Meaning, that's good. Let's say he's righteous for now. But then he offered Isaac and God said, now I know that you fear God. Because you have obeyed my voice, I will do these things. That's when he was a friend of God, right? That's when he was justified. That's the point that James is, is making in James 2 about Abraham. And you can go back and see those references and see their point in time and how that happened. That's the meaning. What's the holy city made out of? It's made out of the righteous deeds of the saints. The wall is the glory of God. The, the city and the street are the righteous deeds of the saints. The foundation is God. He founded it. It's perfect. It's beautiful. It's incredible. Such a blessing that God has done this for us. As we said earlier, uh, you know, we have to take it as seriously as God does, see the value of the things that it's made out of. Because we wouldn't build a wall out of a precious stone like Jasper. <laughs> we wouldn't build a foundation out of every precious stone we can name. And a lot of them I couldn't have named before reading this passage. <laughs> um, but that's telling you how valuable it is to God. The street is gold. You remember it was said about um, Solomon's kingdom that silver was a doorstop. <laughs> silver was as nothing. Look at that city. The street is made of gold. <laughs> Doesn't even have asphalt. <laughs> That's how valuable the church is to God. That's what we're saying. And so it's worth taking that little checkup, isn't it, to say, how valuable is the church to me? What does it mean to me? How am I treating this? And I know that not everybody does the right thing, and sometimes it's not what it should be. Um, as we said, sometimes uh, it's time to raise a lamentation over it. But somebody said to me once, if God seems far, who moved? <laughs> yeah. That's not on God, that's on us, if we're not what we should be. There's something we can do about that. We can repent, and we can come back to God, because He is merciful, and He is faithful to forgive. He has the power to forgive. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. That's the meaning of Isaiah 55 there. Precisely not that he's smarter than us, although he is, or more powerful than we are, though he is. The precise point of Isaiah 55, when he says, as, my, as the earth, uh, heavens are higher than the earth, and uh, uh, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts than your thoughts. Precisely what he's talking about is his ability to forgive. He's much better at forgiving than you and I are. Go back to Isaiah 55 and test, test me, see if that's not true. That is exactly what he's talking about. He is much better at forgiving than we are. 
It's true. He is better at it. But take confidence that God will forgive and he will forget and you can be restored to his service. And that's one of the great precious things about the city of God. So today, if you are not a Christian, become a Christian so that you can be forgiven. God has paid the price for everything with the blood of his son that's really the most precious element in the whole universe. And that will be yours when you put him on in baptism for forgiveness of sins. We referred earlier to 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21 in the same way that uh, people were saved from the flood of Noah by means of an ark. Today, we are saved also through water from the condemnation that is rightly deserved for our sins. We're saved from that through water by baptism in the name of Christ, which gets his power from his resurrection. Today, if you're not a Christian, become a Christian. We have water prepared that you might be baptized in his name. If today you are a Christian but have not lived right, repent, make things right with him. Pray God for forgiveness in the heart, as we saw in Acts 8, for Simon, who had been a sorcerer. Don't call him Simon the sorcerer. He used to be a sorcerer. He repented. <laughs> And if we can pray with you and for you, we'll be happy to do that. If you need our prayers, if you need to be baptized, let it be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing.